Well, good afternoon. I'm Beth Stewart, and on behalf of the Texas Oral Health Coalition, welcome you to our monthly webinar series. Each month, we host different speakers and topics we hope you find interesting and applicable in your work. In support of Oral Cancer Awareness Month, we are excited to offer today's webinar entitled, Let's Prevent Oropharyngeal Cancer and Avoid Awkward Conversations While Doing It, presented by Dr. Rhonda Stokely. Dental providers may earn one hour of continuing dental education credit for submitting the completed online evaluation by April 22nd, 2022. Our presenter today is Dr. Rhonda Stokely, who has served as our State Public Health Dental Director at the Texas Department of State Health Services since 2016. Dr. Stokely plans and directs statewide dental public health programs and activities that focus on maternal and child, oral health surveillance, and HPV vaccination, to name a few. She also serves as an oral health subject matter expert for the agency and other state programs. She is a member of several oral health related committees, boards, and organizations including the Association of State and Territorial Dental Directors. Dr. Stokely was dental director of the Austin State Supported Living Center for seven years and has also owned a private dental practice. She is a 2005 graduate of Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center School of Dentistry. Please help me welcome our esteemed state dental director and the controls are all yours, Dr. Stokely. So hi, everybody. Um, it's good to be with you today. Um, again, my presentation is called Let's Prevent Oropharyngeal Cancer and Avoid Awkward Conversations While Doing It. The objectives today are that I want um, the attendees to be able to state the percentage of oropharyngeal cancers associated with human papillomavirus or HPV be able to list ways they can integrate HPV vaccination conversations into their practices, and then also have to make a strong recommendation for HPV vaccination. <clears throat> First, briefly, just a little bit about our program in case you've never heard of us. Um, we're at the Department of State Health Services and it's the Oral Health Improvement Program. Our priority populations are women and children. Um, that's largely due to the way we're funded. Um, our roles are education, prevention, and surveillance. Some of our main programs are Smiles in Schools, where we conduct school-based screenings um, and also provide preventive services like fluoride varnish and dental sealants. Um, we also have our Smiles for Moms and Babies program, which is a perinatal and infant oral health program. And we also both collect and analyze um, surveillance data about oral health and present that in um, data briefs and presentations, and we call that oral health by the numbers. So first, what is human papillomavirus or HPV? It's a very common virus for one thing, that's the simple answer. It's the most common sexually transmitted infection and there's more than 100 strains of it. Almost everybody's going to get at least one type of HPV at some point. Um, fortunately, most people never know they've been infected. Um, most infections occur um, within the teenage years into the 20s. And there's about 14 million new infections per year in the U.S. It can, HPV can cause six different types of cancer, oropharyngeal, which is why we're here today to talk about it, but also cervical, penile, anal, vulvar, and vaginal cancer. So HPV is associated with oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas, and that is the most common type of oropharyngeal cancer. It's estimated that about 70% of oropharyngeal cancer is attributed to HPV. And used to, um, when we were, you know, increased awareness of the HPV vaccine, it was all about preventing cervical cancer. And actually the incidence of oropharyngeal cancer has passed that of cervical cancer. 
just a brief anatomy review or for anyone in the audience who isn't dental. Um, when I talk about the oropharynx, it's basically the back of the throat, the base of the tongue and the tonsils. So on this chart uh, diagram here, it's the green area. So the very back of the mouth. Used to, um, before the, in, the rise in HPV-associated OPC, um, we would tend to see oral cancer in um, older patients. You know, you'd often think of the, the older person, maybe 70, who, who has done a lifetime of smoking and drinking, that sort of person. Um, but with HPV-associated cancer, we tend to see it in younger, healthier patients. Um, the median age at diagnosis is around 54, and they may not have any kind of a significant tobacco or alcohol history. The good thing about this type of cancer though, um, is that the five-year survival rate is much better when it is HPV associated. The survival rate's over 75% in that case. Um, whereas if it's um, non-HPV associated, it's often less than 50%. Um, there's no effective screening tool for it. The only way we can diagnose that it's HPV associated um, cancer is through a biopsy. And it's on the rise. Uh, the, the kind of the grayish line here is for the US and blue is Texas. The incidence rate in Texas is a little bit lower than in the US overall. We have, um, this is a combination of data um, from 2013 to 2017. And we have about 4.5 cases per 100,000, um, which may not sound like a lot, but we don't want there to be any. And if you notice these lines on this chart, it's increasing, so it's only going to get higher from here. When we break um, oropharyngeal cancer incidence down by race and ethnicity, we see it most commonly in non-Hispanic whites, and we often see it um, more commonly in men than in women. Um, so just letting you kind of see how that breaks down. Um, the lowest is in Hispanic or really actually non-Hispanic Asian Pacific Islanders, but still very low with both groups. So some of the things that we're looking for, some of the signs and symptoms of oral and oropharyngeal cancer are sores in the mouth that don't heal, pain in the mouth that doesn't go away, lumps or thickenings in the cheek, white or red patches, a sore throat or, or the feeling that something's stuck in the throat and that feeling that doesn't go away, difficulty chewing or swallowing or trouble moving the jaw or the tongue. Some others are numbness um, of the a tongue or other areas of the mouth, um, swelling of the jaw, teeth can become loose or there can be pain around teeth or the jaw. The voice may change. There might be a lump or mass in the neck, weight loss or constant bad breath. And that's as far as we're gonna go into the screening aspect because our conversation here is more about how to have conversations about the vaccine. But I wanna take this moment to say, if you haven't recently taken a refresher course on oral cancer screenings, you really need to do that. So, so please put that on your to-do list. So HPV vaccination, also known as cancer prevention. I mean, that is an amazing thing that there are cancers we can prevent through something as simple as a vaccine. A little history about the vaccine, it's called Gardasil and it's manufactured by Merck. It first became available in 2006. Um, and in 2014, they increased the number of strains. Um, so it can protect against these nine strains. The one we care about most though is strain 16 because that's the one that's associated with oropharyngeal cancer. And back in 2020, the FDA um, approved Merck's request to add oropharyngeal cancer prevention as an indication for the vaccine. So what age? Um, kind of what's considered the ideal age is around 11 to 12 years of age, um, but it can be um, given as early as age nine. And over time, they've kind of increased um, the age recommendation. So catch-up vaccination is recommended up to age 26. And there's some circumstances, I mean, it would really be discussion with the doctor, but some circumstances where that may extend up to age 45. But what we want to focus on most is these younger patients, um, kind of these preteen years. 
the side effects for this vaccine are the same sort of side effects you see with other types of vaccines, um, pain, redness, and swelling at the injection site. There could be dizziness or fainting, nausea, or headaches. So why vaccinate early? Why do we really focus on that early age? For one thing, the body elicits a stronger immune response when you administer the vaccine at that age. There's research that shows that it does better. And because of that, fewer doses are needed for the vaccine when you start early. And then also we're trying to get children vaccinated before they're exposed to HPV. So how are we doing in Texas? Um, this data is from 2019. And at that time we ranked 41st out of 50 states in DC for HPV vaccination for kids 13 to 17. We've gone up some since then. I think we've gone to about 39th, but with some of that more recent data, I didn't see how we compared with other states. So we're going with the 2019 right here. Um, the set of columns on the left are for at least one dose of the vaccine. The second set of columns means up to date. So whether you're at an age where that means two vaccines or an age it means three, whatever that is that you've completed the series that you need. So we're lagging behind the U.S. in general. Um, according to the 2019 data, 65% um, in Texas for the first dose and then um, less than half for series completion. This is some data from 2020, and you can see here that with HPV um, up to date on the series, we've gone up to 55, almost 55%. So we're definitely on the rise in Texas. I mean, there's really been a concerted effort through a lot of different groups to get children vaccinated, children and young adults vaccinated for HPV. But you can see here, what I wanna point out on this chart is that there's a real disconnect. Um, the two vaccines on the right, one is for meningococcal disease and the other is for Tdap, which is tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. Those are common um, vaccines given around this age. Sometimes pediatricians will refer to them as the preteen vaccines. So look at the rates that kids are getting those. I mean, we're in the 80, upper 80s and 90s for those. Well, at that same time, those kids could at least be initiating that HPV vaccine, but yet we're down in the low 70s. So kids are going to the pediatrician. We've just got to work on getting them that HPV vaccine. So how does the dental team fit into all this? What you need to do is your routine oral cancer screenings and make strong recommendations for the HPV vaccine. So you'll hear me say strong recommendations a lot. Um, and so then there's the question, well, what do I mean by strong recommendation? You wanna be clear, you wanna be assertive and you want to leave no room for doubt that you believe this is what they need to do. Um, think of it the same way, you know, we, we sit through webinars and, and courses on how to get patients to accept treatment plans or how to get the patient to say yes to that crown that you're telling them they need. Well, you're being taught in those how to make a strong recommendation. If you, you know, are talking to them about a crown, you're kind of like, well, you know, there's the chance this thing could break. I don't know when, you know, and you, you're, you kind of leave them an out. A lot of times people will take the out. But if you're firm about it, look, there is a crack on this tooth. This has got to get covered or this tooth is going to be in trouble. You take that same approach when talking about the vaccine. We want to prevent your child from getting this type of cancer and several other types too. They need to go get vaccinated. The CDC, um, their How I Recommend page has some great little um, video scenarios um, related to a variety of vaccines, but also HPV vaccine. Um, and, and it has different scenarios. Um, what if, you know, what do you tell parents who think their kids don't need it? A number of scenarios, and you can click on those and see videos to see how pediatricians handle it. Now, of course, they're kind of talking from a pediatrician's perspective, but it still gives you some good insights on what these conversations can look like. And that's CDC, how I recommend. So some of you might be thinking, 
why me? I mean, this is the pediatrician's job or the primary care provider. Why do I need to get into this? It's not even like I can give it to them in the office here in Texas. And I'll tell you why. Some children are more likely to see us than they will their primary care provider. They may come to see us twice a year. Um, they may be behind on their annual wellness checks. They might just be going in for problem focused exams for the most part over there. We get more time with them oftentimes than their pediatrician. We're a trusted source. People trust what we say. Oropharyngeal cancer rates are increasing and we don't want our patients to get it. So that's why we need to recommend it. And it takes a village. And what I mean by that, you know, maybe they did go see their pediatrician. The pediatrician tried to recommend, you know, you need to get this vaccine as well. And they, and, and I'll think about it, you know, kind of brushed it off. Well, then here they come into you and you're cleaning their child's teeth. And here it's coming up again when you make the recommendation. All those little you know, instances that it's put in front of them can lead them to go ahead and make that decision to do it. Your recommendation carries a lot more weight than you might think. So how to recommend it. There's been some research, um, uh, quite a bit of research around um, dentists and dental hygienists and HPV vaccine. And this particular one that was in JADA, um, let's see, when was that? Back in 2018, they did some um, focus group interviews um, and, and some of the comments that came up that dentists didn't like to talk about it or recommend it. Some of the reasons were they, they didn't like trying to assess a patient, kind of size them up and see what their risk might be for getting it. They didn't want to ask parents um, or patients um, if they engage in oral sex. And they didn't have private rooms to discuss such a delicate situation um, privately with patients. We conducted a survey um, of dentists in Dallas County um, a couple of years ago, and we had 71 dentists who responded to us. And um, over 64% of them are not routine, routinely recommending the vaccine. And I'm not picking on them entirely. I think we would see similar um, responses with any county that we surveyed. So what we're gonna talk about now are different ways to avoid kind of what those dentists and those focus groups were saying. I mean, we, we don't have to turn this into some weird, awkward, Thing, and we don't have to do it in some way that upends our schedule and the flow of practice and takes a ton of time. So that's what we're going to dive into now. One of the simplest things is update your medical history form. Don't ask on the medical history form if they engage in oral sex. Just ask if they've been vaccinated for HPV or not. That's all you need to ask. Add a medical prompt, something that flashes up with patients that are in the recommend, recommended age range um, that patient is due for HPV vaccine. So you've just got that little flag, just like if they're allergic to um, amoxicillin, a little flag that they're due for that. So it jogs your memory to make sure you bring it up to that patient. Or if they were in last time, it's your jogger to say, hey, did you go get it? Some other things. Bring it up in the morning huddle if your practice does morning huddles. You know, Dr. Stokely, Sarah is going to be here at 10 o'clock for her filling. She's 11 and she's due for her HPV vaccine. Um, another thing you can do is have the dentist and the assistants, I mean, the, the dental hygienists and assistants bring it up. Um, you know, they're, they're probably the ones maybe checking over the health history with patients before the dentist comes in they can bring it up um, and ask about it and, and recommend it. And then, so they sort of tee it up, if you will. And then the dentist can just kind of come in and say, yes, they need to do it. But kind of more, the little bit more work and time was spent um, by the hygienist or the assistant. So here's team approach scenario, part one. Assistant says to the patient, um, I see that Sarah is 11 now. Has she gotten her first HPV vaccination yet? Mom says no. The assistant says, Dr. Stokely recommends that all her young patients get the HPV vaccination to prevent oral cancer. She'll probably talk to you about it. Mom says, okay. So it's already kind of been brought up. Mom's expecting to hear about this from the dentist. And we've said the most important thing, we want to prevent oral cancer. That's why my dentist is talking to me about this. And that's why they want me to get vaccinated. So then dentist comes in, 
um, assistant says to the dentist um, with the parent sitting there, Dr. Stokely, I told Mrs. Jones that since Sarah's 11, she's due for her HPV vaccine. Then all you have to do is say, yes, you should get Sarah scheduled for the HPV vaccine. It prevents oral cancer and several other types as well. So you can see how you can do it in a way that is not getting awkward. It's not taking a lot of time either. You're just bringing it up, you know, hopefully they'll go. And if they don't go, you're at least putting that seed, you know, planting that seed, if you will. Some other things you can do in your office, make sure that you've got some educational materials. I mean, do you have some kind of a pamphlet you can give them? Um, maybe some kind of a poster um, where someone could look at it and ask about it. There's some pretty neat ones. I've got a few that are kind of scattered throughout this presentation here um, along the lines of, you know, if you could prevent your child from getting cancer, wouldn't you do it? Another thing is to get the whole team involved. Make sure everyone in your office understands the importance of the vaccine, knows where the resources are, and that they know how to talk about it. Because um, you don't want them going down some awkward trail of conversation either. Everyone needs to know what you feel about it, which is that the kids should do it and why to prevent cancer. Know where to send patients. Um, probably they already have a primary care doctor or a pediatrician. They can just go there to get it. Um, but know it's in your area. If there's a health clinic nearby, you know, be aware that that's you know a few blocks away that they could go over there. There's also a resource in Texas called 211 where someone could call in and say, hey, I live in this town. We need to go get a vaccine. And they can help um, direct them to the closest place for them. And cost is not a problem. Um, the HPV vaccine is part of the Texas Vaccines for Children program, which makes the vaccine available at no charge to all boys and girls 9 to 18 who are either under, underinsured or uninsured. So what to say? Again, it does not have to be a conversation about sex. You do not have to turn it into that kind of a conversation. Keep the conversation focused on oral health and cancer prevention because HPV is the leading cause of oral cancer. And you'll see here, a lot of times I say oral and instead of, you know, kind of when I'm talking like I'm talking to patients, I tend to say oral instead of oropharyngeal because that's a bigger word they haven't heard, but it's also kind of a mouthful to say, you know, the back of the mouth and the throat. So I, I often just kind of say oral cancer just to keep it a little bit simpler um, for patient communication. So just to reiterate, <laughs> you can talk about the vaccine without talking about oral sex. You never have to say the terms penile cancer, vulvar cancer, or anal cancer. And you never have to discuss anyone's sexual activity or their future sexual activity or what age they might be when they start engaging in sexual activity. You never have to talk about those things to recommend the vaccine. But say, you, say you're doing all the right things. Well, then you're getting kind of some questions that you're trying to field from the, the parents. You're like, oh my gosh, it, it's getting awkward. How do, I, how do I bail myself out of this? So here's a few um, situations and some ways that you can kind of easily get yourself out of it without going down a road that, that makes you feel uncomfortable discussing. So number one, you make a strong recommendation for the HPV vaccine and mom pushes back either because of anti-vaccine sentiment or concerns about promoting sexual activity in her preteen. You're getting some resistance from mom, just back up and say, I hear your concerns. I, I encourage you to go talk to Sarah's doctor about them and just leave it there. It's not, you don't have to fight about it. Just leave it there. Situation number two, you make a strong recommendation for the HPV vaccine and mom says, but I thought HPV cancers are related to sex. Just say, that's right. And HPV can cause oral cancer too. You don't have to get into any more details or anything like that. Mom can connect the dots on her own. Um, you just say yes, and it can cause oral cancer too. 
All right, scenario number three. You make a strong recommendation for the HPV vaccine and mom tells you that she does not think her 10 year old son needs it yet because he will not become sexually active until at least his late teens or early 20s. Do not tell mom that she only thinks she knows what her son is going to be up to when he's 14 years old. Do tell her that research shows that this is the best age for giving it because of the immune response and he'll only need two shots instead of three. And do tell her to take any other concerns to her son's doctor. It's all you got to do. Here's another one. Scenario four. You make a strong recommendation for the HPV vaccine and you're getting hit with all kinds of questions and you don't know the answers to any of it. Relax because you don't have to. This isn't your area of expertise and it doesn't have to be. It is perfectly okay to say, I'm not an expert on every detail of the vaccine. So I want you to take these questions to your child's doctor. That is a perfectly acceptable thing to say. It gets you out of it. It's telling them that those questions are important, but you want them to speak to someone who's got more of those answers than what you've got. So your to-do list, you need to add HPV vaccine questions to your health history. That's one of the easiest things you can do. Add in there, have you taken the vaccine? Have you completed the series? Um, you could also consider asking a question, would you like to learn more about how to prevent cancer um, with the HPV vaccine? Make plans, some kind of plan for flagging your patients. So y'all always know who's coming in that's of the age that you should be recommending it um, and set yourself up so that you don't have to think about it so heavily every single time. Flagged on the chart would be great if you can do it that way. Make sure all your staff are on board. You need to tell all of them why you think that the vaccine is important and why you think it's important. Come up with a game plan for bringing it up to patients, whether it's like I suggested earlier, you know, where the hygienist maybe brings it up when they're reviewing the health history, talks about it a little bit, and then the dentist just has to basically nod in agreement and say, yes, get vaccinated. Or you could do it in a different way, whatever way works in your office, but kind of have it thought out how you're going to bring it up. It would be good if you had a resource um, for your patients to give them some kind of a brochure, a handout um, that can answer more questions that they may have. Brush up on your oral cancer screening skills, because while we're doing our best to prevent it by getting these kids vaccinated, it's still out there. So make sure you're not missing it. We really want to try to, you know, of course, you know, early detection is the best thing. So really brush up on those skills and be observant. And then practice strong recommendations. Don't be waffly, don't be iffy, be strong about it, be firm. You think this kid needs the vaccine. Another item on your to-do list is you can send us your address and we will mail you free um, ADA HPV pamphlets. So you can just email us here at dental at dshs.texas.gov. I'm going to let this stay on here for just a second and say, in case someone's grabbing their cell phone to take a picture of the email address, but send us your address and we will mail you pamphlets. Um, we, we ordered some directly from the ADA and they're really good. So get them and, and put it into practice, um, giving those out to patients. And I'll be, I would love any feedback you would have. And, and that goes for this presentation as well. Um, if you have any thoughts about anything that I shared today, email us and let us know. I mean, that, that's how we get better and better at what we do. Here are some additional resources. Um, again, 211 is a great way to locate um, services like vaccinations. Um, HPV Roundtable is a good source. We have a really good um, HPV coalition here in Texas, the Texas HPV Coalition. Um, and there's also some other information on here with fact sheets um, and information from the CDC. For a close, I wanna give a special thanks to Brittany Lohman. Um, she is my program operations coordinator um, and put a lot of work into this, helping me get ready for this presentation. 
I also want to thank the Texas HPV Coalition for their support. Um, they've been a really good group to work with and the Texas Oral Health Coalition for allowing us to speak today. So if you want to learn, oh, I heard something. Was that you, Beth? Yes, I thought you were three. Go ahead. Almost done. Almost done. Um, if you want to learn more about oral health in Texas, um, you can visit our website, dshs.texas.gov slash dental. You can also subscribe for updates. Um, it, it's not like, you know, we're trying to sell things. The updates aren't that often, only when we think it's really relevant, some new information on the website or some kind of an announcement that we think is newsworthy. You can scan this QR code here, or um, if you go to our homepage, there's a subscribe button. That's what the little red arrow there is pointing to. It's on the upper right hand of our screen. And you can also, again, contact us. Just email us if you have questions, and we will be happy to answer those for you. And now, Beth, I, this is my official closing. So thank you, everyone, for your attention. And wow, I realized that was really kind of, kind of short. So we've got lots of time for discussion or questions if anybody has any. We do have a couple of questions uh, in the chat box. And Dr. Stokely, that was a wonderful presentation. I loved it. What great tips and resources. I, I do want to ask real quick, is that CDC poster that was on one of your slides, is that uh, one of the resources that you linked uh, to? I believe so. I believe okay. I linked to it on there. Um, oh. Let me, I'm looking on this slide real quick. I haven't but, seen that one before and it was really good. Yeah, there's some good ones. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a variety of them and you'll see some of them especially have um, boys in there because we were so thinking, you know, oh, we have to prevent cervical cancers. We've got to get girls vaccinated. No, we've got to get boys vaccinated too. Exactly. Um, but I, I'm looking at the website. It's um, CDCD, CD. CDC.gov slash vaccines slash teens. And I can probably get that typed into the oh, chat okay. I was going to say, Jessica's trying it also. You can check it and see if it's correct. Uh, well, let me go ahead and ask you a couple of questions. Vikarani um, asked, what percentage of HPV causes oral cancer? Uh, any work on mRNA vax to prevent oral cancer in general versus just HPV? I don't know anything about mRNA vaccines um, related to this. Um, so unfortunately, I can't help with that. Um, what was the first part of the question again, Beth? What percentage of HPV causes oral cancer? I wrote down 70. Well, I HPV causes 70% of oropharyngeal cancer. Okay. Um, but I'm not sure what percent of HPV causes cancer, oral cancer. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. but, but HPV causes 70% of the oropharyngeal cancers that we have. Okay. That's a lot. All right. Um, let's see. Let me go up here because he asked him questions up a little higher. Uh, let's see. Any hypothesis? Why is there such a wide discrepancy with race? Um, I think a lot of it has to do basically with sexual practices, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why not vax older people? Because usually, um, you know, and they, they say up to 26 now, um, they usually don't stress it for older than that because usually people have already had contact with HPV. They've already gotten it. They've already engaged in sexual activity um, and become infected with it. So you, you kind of wait too late and probably they already have. And that's why they say in, in some circumstances, it might be okay for someone older, but, um, and, and I've never seen that really elaborated why, but I would say someone who's maybe had limited to no sexual activity where they're likely haven't been exposed yet. Mm -hmm. that's, that's probably a good, very good guess. Uh, okay, we put in HPV. Uh, let's see. Any proposals to get dentist to vax? It's not really caused by... Uh, go ahead. Well, um, in Oregon uh, is the only state that I know of that they have passed in their legislature that dentists can administer the HPV vaccine. Um, and I don't know yet how many have taken it on um, and how that's going so far. Um, I know with some of the early discussion, you know, it, it it's more complicated than just having the shots there to give. You've got to store it. You know, it, it, I think they have to be refrigerated. They've got to have the uh, right kind of refrigerator and the right temperature. Um, 
and just logistics with the quantity that you order and then trying to bill. Um, so Oregon, I guess, is working through all of that now that, that dentists are able to administer there. Um, so, but nothing like that yet here in Texas. Well, we kind of saw the same thing with uh, the COVID vaccinations. You know, if dentists can give it, but then again, you have storage problems and um, making sure everything is still current and it's a big expense. Yeah, it can be. And so you've got to make sure you get through that, vo you know, that volume before they expire. And I, I have no idea what quantities that you order them in. I'm not really sure how all that behind the scenes part of it works. Okay. Uh, well, if anybody would like to raise their hand, we can certainly unmute you so you could ask uh, Dr. Stokely your question verbally. Um, I'm not seeing anything in the Q&A or anything else that's come up in the chat box. And the main uh, thing, I, oh, go okay. ahead, Beth. Well, oh, I was I was gonna, <laughs> no, you go first. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, the main reason we're, we're trying to have this conversation is that really, I mean, people do get the heebie jibbies about talking about it and, and really just focus on the cancer prevention. That's what you need to do. Um, I mentioned it. I won't say, you know, who, but I had mentioned it to a pediatric dentist. Do y'all ever talk about it? And he got this look like, oh, you know, wow. I mean, that was the look like, ooh, I don't want to go down that road. Um, and even um, my own daughter, um, her pediatrician's office, they're, they're kind of getting kind of weird about it. Um, like my daughter doesn't need all that conversation. Just tell her she's got to get a vaccine. I mean, she's, she doesn't ask why for any of them. She's due for it. She's got to get it. She just goes to get it. You know, um, she doesn't ask me either why she needs a Tdap or why she needs, you know, any other vaccine that she gets. Um, so I, I, I love that. Well, I loved your answer. Yeah. And I loved your answer that you don't have to talk about sex, but it's, it's to prevent oral cancer, you know, and that should be enough. And it, and it really should be. I did notice I attended a conference um, in El Paso a number of years ago, and El Paso has one of the highest rates for vaccinations in the entire state. And I asked um, a, a pediatrician why I said, well, how, how come y'all are so high? And he said, because the doctors recommend the vaccinations. He said, in, in Hispanic culture, a lot of respect, you, you do what your doctor tells you to do. So if the pediatrician or the physician is saying it and it's double down from the dentist, they're hearing it there also, that just reinforces that need. And, and I don't need I, more of that. Yes, El Paso. I mean, it's just doing amazing things out there. And I've heard a lot of that is due to one, um, maybe a pediatrician, but I think they, te they, they oh, teach all their residents where they're teaching, like everybody, it's, it's ingrained in them to recommend yeah. this vaccine. And I mean, you can, the numbers are there. I mean, yeah. they're incredibly higher than anyone else in the state. But I mean, I've got to say we're doing really good. It wasn't just a few years ago that we were 47. So, I mean, it's, we're getting there. I mean, we're, you know, it, it's going to take all of us, but, you know, now I think we're at about 39th or so. Um, mm. So we're really making great strides in Texas to increase the rate of vaccination. We just still have room to go. Yeah. And I think that the talking tips that you shared today will really help make those conversations much, much easier. It doesn't have to be difficult. And um, I think, I think what you provided today was really, really good. Let's see, I'm seeing something in the Q&A box. Let me pull it up here. Uh, very informative. Thanks for your time. Thank uh, you. And uh, It's nice to hear that because especially when you're doing this virtually, you know, you don't get to see heads nod or people doze off to sleep, whatever their reaction is. So it's it's nice to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, and if and anybody's you don't, got, if you don't have to hear the applause, yeah. <laughs> there would be much applause after this, I'll tell you. Um, Let's see, any other questions? We have, we have a, a few more minutes. Um, okay, let me hear something, let's see. Clap, clap. <laughs> Thank you, Vic. <laughs> That's good. Well, let me make another quick announcement before we, and if you think of something, go ahead and put it in the chat box or raise your hand. I do wanna provide a quick reminder to please save the date for our next webinar on Friday, May 13th at 12 noon uh, central time when Dr. Mark Bullock will be presenting special conditions 
Barriers and Challenges Providing Dental Care to Patients with IDD. This is the second webinar in a special three-part series about providing dental care for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. If you missed his first webinar about providing dental care under advanced anesthesia, oral sedation, IV sedation, TIVA, IV MAC, and general anesthesia, you can view the recorded version from our website under the education tab, live webinar, um, and we can put these links into the chat box or you can see the video on YouTube uh, as well. So we'll put both of those links in the chat box. Uh, let's see, there's another chat. Um, oh, that's Jessica putting the information in there. Um, well, if there are no more questions or comments from anyone, does anyone want to make a comment? Um, oh, are these slides uh, available? Can we have like a PDF of the slides that sure. we can put on our website? Okay. Now, remember the recorded version of this webinar and we'll have the PDF of the slides because there was a lot of, you may want to go back and look at those tips again. Um, and we'll put that on our website. Again, it'll be under the education tab under live webinars and you'll see. Uh, Dr. Stokely's uh, name and, and title of her presentation there. So you can click on that and get all of that information. We'll have the recorded everything down uh, and uploaded by the first part of next week for you. So all of that will be available then. Uh, MPH student, oh, what great. Thank you, I really appreciate that. This, again, this was an exceptional webinar. You did you did a great job and I love the information that you shared. We need to get it out. So well, I'm counting on, yeah, go ahead. One of the things that I really like about this is that it's so easy. I mean, it's not like you're trying to really change that, you know, you're not having to add to patient chair time. I mean, really all you're doing is just recommending it, telling them they should go get it and you're done. But you've, you've made a huge step towards preventing cancer. But I love the easiness of it. Absolutely. And the part at the very beginning when you said be sure and add it to your medical histories, does the CDC or ADA offer a template of a medical history that already includes those questions that a dental practice could adopt and not implement in their own? Not that I'm aware of, but really it can be just as simple as have you been vaccinated or have you received the HPV vaccine? And then it's up to you if you want to put a, a question below that. Would you like to receive more information? Um, you know, I guess you run the risk of them saying no. So if, you, if they if you don't have yes or no, then you can just bring it up to them when they come in. Well, and, and it was a really good idea also because uh, in the morning huddles, you know, when they're when you're going over the patients coming in and you know those ages and you can see and just ask them, are you have you had it and and um, and, and reemphasize it again there. Some really good tips. I'm, I was, uh, I'm very, very pleased uh, with you. the information that you shared. It was very good. So hopefully people will start to incorporate into their practices. Um, any other questions or, or last comments? We'll give you back part of your noon hour. Uh, if not, we'll go ahead and do, um, we're a little less than the, the hour. Um, any other questions at all? from anybody <laughs> comments we Beth, have to go over a certain time to offer a full hour ce is why Beth, i don't think i've ever gone so short in a presentation in my life like i was looking at my watch thinking oh, wow what what happened you know so often you worry about running over on time i know um, exactly this is a challenge all in its own um well, we'll go ahead and give you your time back today. And um, uh, again, thank you so much, Dr. Stokely. This was a great presentation. Uh, you know, give me some post questions and we'll, we'll get, we can add it all as an on-demand uh, presentation if, okay. if you want to do something like that. That would sure. be kind of nice. That way people could, uh, this is something that's ongoing. They can look at it anytime and yeah. uh, we could offer CE for it. Oh, here's one last thing maybe. <laughs> Let me see what they say. Oh, it's just thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Johnson. <laughs> all right. Y'all all have a wonderful day and a, and a wonderful weekend. And thank you again, Dr. Stokely. I'll let you have your lunch hour back. And, and thank you. And we'll see you soon, okay? All right. Bye, everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.